Hey everyone, today I wanted to talk about vinegar. Vinegar is one of my favorites of the alchemies that I practice. Uh, I love vinegar, I love everything about it, and since we're now entering uh, apple season, either, you know, depending on your trees and where you are, uh, we're in apple season already or on the way there to apple season, it's a very appropriate time to be talking about it. So. I can't say when I first learned to make vinegar or how, um, but it was probably around the same time I was learning how to make wine. Uh, so probably a bit more than a decade ago. I didn't have anyone to teach me, and uh, like nearly other, like nearly every other craft and alchemy I have learned and loved, I was appalled. I was appalled at the time um, when I would look in books, and uh, I was searching the internet back then to ask, how do you make vinegar? I was appalled that, you know, answers were, well, first buy some vinegar, <laughs> then take some herbs and fruits and put it in the vinegar, and that's how you make, you know, an herbed vinegar or a fruit vinegar. I was just like, oh my fucking god, like, I want to kill all these people, figuratively speaking. Um, so I think at the time, I... All I had was uh, a friend, an acquaintance of mine at the time, had said something. I guess she was learning how to make vinegar, and she had just exclaimed, like, Oh my god, I had no idea that you could just put apple slices in a bowl of water, and they would turn into vinegar. Uh, and that was really my impetus at the time. I was like, Oh, really? That's it, huh? And so I just uh, right away started doing that. And that really is it. So... I've been making vinegars um, throughout all that time, uh, the last decade or more. I make them in all the different places that I go. Uh, I'm very proud of my vinegars. I love my vinegars. They're delicious and I make all different kinds. Um, and one of the reasons I'm so proud of them, for one is they're absolutely delicious and magical. I just, you can just drink them, they're so great. Um, but another reason that I, I feel so strongly about these vinegars is because you don't need any products whatsoever. Um, just, just the fruit that you're picking. And you also don't need any special equipment. So you don't need a press, like to press apple juice or a juicer or anything like that. Um, you don't need any more equipment than what you could scrounge up uh, around nearly any house or farm. So you can make vinegar out of tons of different fruits, probably infinite. Um, uh, anything that's sugary, really. Um, but definitely the greatest volume of vinegar I have made uh, the most frequently over the years has been from apples. And uh, much like how I feel that grapes just kind of naturally turn themselves into wine, like they just really want to be wine. That apples just turn themselves into vinegar. They really want to be vinegar, so they work so well, so easily. They make such a wonderful vinegar. Um, and it really only takes, you know, if you just have one good old apple tree that drops quite a bit of apples, um, that's all you need. Um, uh, but as I have moved around and, and traveled over the years, um, Occasionally, I've had access to like an entire orchard, like old abandoned orchard that is still fruiting heavily, but that no one really cares cares about maintaining. Sorry, cat, cat. Sorry, you want to come out? Come in, come in, sweetie. Um, but you don't need that many. Um, you know, just you know, honestly, a basket full. Some other really amazing vinegars I made over the years that stand out to me are um, pawpaw vinegar. One year, this was many years ago, I actually tried to make pawpaw wine and uh, it just got so thick that the wine went off and it didn't work and I forgot about it for a while and came back to it quite some time later and it was just the mo one of the most amazing vinegars I have ever tasted. Oh, that was so good. Um, a year or two ago, I made mango vinegar down in South Florida. Uh, down there, it's just coconut and mango land. Like, mangoes just litter all the... They're just rotting on the sidewalks everywhere in the summertime. There's just mango trees everywhere. 
So I made mango vinegar for the first time, and it's really, really nice. I'm still traveling around. I still have at least a bottle left of that vinegar, and it's almost red, like pinkish red. Oh my gosh, that was good. Um, and also last year, just last uh, autumn, winter for the first time, I made American persimmon vinegar, which I don't know why I'd never thought of using American persimmons for vinegar. And gosh, they really just turned themselves into vinegar. I was I was going for wine and they were like, no, we want to be vinegar. Um, and interesting, the vinegar wasn't orange like the persimmons. Uh, the vinegar was nearly colorless, kind of like a light yellow. Like it was really weird that the pigment didn't travel over into the vinegar. Wow, that was delicious. Wow, wow, wow. Um, so here's the thing, is that uh, vinegar making is a, is a fermentation process. And uh, I would say all fermentation is, most fermentation, all, is basically glorified rot. So you can get very fussy about it and very technical if you want to, but that's your choice. You don't have to, that's not necessary. So people will often ask, sometimes will ask me, like, oh, if we went to collect some, you know, really nice black raspberries or wine berries or something, brought them home, could we make a really fancy nice vinegar, like a berry vinegar? And my answer is always, no, heck no, I would never do that. Um, and the reason I would never do that is simply that um, if I have nice fruit that's eating quality, like if you know, you go through all the work to pick a bunch of nice berries or nice fruits and they are, they're good and delicious for eating. Like, I save those for food, right? Like, eat them at every meal, make a pie, freeze them if you want to, can them. My God, like, that's food. Uh, vinegar is what I make with the scraps that I would ordinarily otherwise compost. So the fruit parts that are essentially of no food value to me. That's why vinegar is so magical to me, because you're basically making it out of nothing, right? You're making it out of stuff you would normally compost. So like the rotten fruit, the cores, the skins, the pits, that stuff, okay? And typically that actually makes the better vinegar, mm -hmm. the stuff that's overripe and juicy and funky. And um, so with apples, that means the wind-fallen fruits also. So yeah, whether it's one tree or whether it's, you know, just an old, large, old orchard, my God, you know, you can just walk into a nice, old, abandoned orchard and just the, the apples covering the ground. I mean, you could fill a dump truck with it. Just there's so many. And all of those, you know, the one, they, it's fine if they're bruised, if they got spots on them, if you're worried about bugs or weren't, whatever. As long as the fruits aren't like totally black or smushy or like clearly just completely disintegrating, as long as they're relatively intact, like you can pick them up and put them in a basket, fantastic for vinegar. Those can all be vinegar. Um, uh, and the same goes for other fruits also. So for example, just to illustrate that, in really good apple years, I'm harvesting, you know, just bushels and bushels of apples. Uh, most often for me, I'm drying fruit since I'm so uh, landless often and, and moving around and don't always have electricity and, and nice appliances. Um, drying is, is my main way that I'm preserving food. So often I'll be drying uh, or dehydrating lots and lots and lots and lots of apples. So it's the cores. So it's the cores or the funky parts, the bad parts of the apples or the very bruised, windfallen apples that I'm using to make the vinegar. Um, in the example of the mango vinegar, I was harvesting all the mangoes, and I was also drying mangoes, which is kind of crazy. They have so much water content, but they came out so good. So many mangoes, mountains of mangoes. Um, so I was skinning the mangoes, uh, and then cutting uh, the nice fleshy uh, flesh of the fruit off of the pits. So the pits are still kind of got a bunch of sugary pulp still stuck on them, and the skins do also. So it was just the pits and the skins that I was using to make the vinegar, right? Which are just wet and sloppy and sticky, and they got a lot of sugars in there. So I just throw all, throw all those into a bowl. Um, in the instance of the American persimmons, 
I made a raw mush mush, so I took some really nice, very fresh, or sorry, very uh, uh, ripe, sweet American persimmons, and I just like pushed them all through uh, like a colander to, or, like, to smush out the puree, the raw puree, and then to leave all the, the seeds in the colander. So all the seeds, the solids, which still had goop stuck to them, that's what I made the vinegar out of, okay? So you understanding what I'm saying here? It's like I harvest a big basket of persimmons and I still get jars of delicious persimmon fruit to eat and I get vinegar, okay? I harvest a whole, you know, I pick up a whole bunch of mangoes. I get tons of dried mangoes and fresh eating mangoes and I get vinegar, okay? That's why it's so magical. Um, uh, and all of this is not adding any sugar. So great. Okay, so um, right now uh, I have a bunch of pears. We have a really nice pear tree here that just, oh my god, it fruited so heavily. So we've just had baskets and baskets of pears. Uh, here they are, just beautiful pears. And uh, the thing about pears is that they don't ripen on the tree. You know, once they, once you shake them off or once they fall off, they're still hard. And then you kind of set them around in baskets and they they ripen, you know, over days and weeks they get soft. So keeping up with them as they soften. Like every day I have to um, check all the baskets and feel all the pears for the ones that are getting soft or the ones that are getting rotten. And kind of take those out and prioritize them and put them in the basket on the kitchen table for like, okay, these are the ones we need to eat next. And if they don't get eaten fast enough, um, then I, you know, every day or two will take a, a batch of them and, and slice them to dry, to put them up for winter. Um, so I've been making pear vinegar, and I don't, I don't remember if, it, if I've ever made pear vinegar before. I might have made pear wine in the past, um, but they're super sugary, they're super sweet and juicy and really soft. So that's what I really go for with a, with a, a fruit for making vinegar. And I have a few batches already going, and they're going pretty well, so we'll take a look at those at the end here. But for right now, I'm going to show you what I'm doing with these guys today. So here's what I'm doing. I'm simply just uh, slicing the pears to dehydrate them. And obviously, in the process, I'm cutting out the cores because they're tough where all the seeds are. Right? So that's what I'm going to do out here for a while and just go through all these pears. And as I go, uh, the cores, you know, like this, and any spots that are just like really mushy and like rotty or foul. So any of my scraps, you know, just keep, like keep a bowl of the scraps right here. Um, and occasionally, every once in a while, like one of these pears like maybe it fell off the tree and just got really bruised and so then it I'll cut it open and it's just like really soft on the inside even though it's still light colored it's really soft and it doesn't taste good so in those instances the entire pear I'm just putting in my scrap bucket here okay so I'm gonna slice all my pears once I get that done I'll show you uh, my scrap bucket at the end and also, like, so much juice will collect on the board here because these are so juicy. Like, oh my god. Ugh, they just, like, turn into water in your mouth. They're so sweet. Like, the juice as it builds up, I'll even pick up the cutting board and, like, pour the juice into my scrap bucket here because that's all good stuff. Okay, here we go. Okay, so my pear's slices are all in the dehydrator. Uh... A gadget that is makes drying food uh, stupidly easy, and a gadget which I really resent relying upon. Uh, but here in the southeast in the summertime, it is absolutely horrendous for sun drying foods with the constant rain and nearly 100% humidity. Anyway, there's my little rant. So. Uh, here's all my scraps from just that little bit of pears. It's a lot of scraps because actually like two or three of those pears, like the whole pears were like really soft and gross. So that's a lot of scraps, right? Um, and this is just one little batch of pears that I was uh, drying. So you can see how like 
that's a lot of sugars in there. And being that this stuff is just like so wet, like look how juicy and wet, it's just falling apart. So juicy, so sweet, so high sugar content. So all these sugars are so useful. So that's what is gonna become our vinegar. So um, you may have noticed with everything that I've been sharing, uh, the vinegars that I typically make the most often, the vinegars I've had the most success with are from fruits that are very high sugar content. Okay, like mangoes, very high sugar content. American persimmon, the highest sugar content wild fruit in the southeast. Uh, you know, pears, apples, bananas, very high sugar content. So uh, keep that in mind. And the reason for that is because we're going to water it down. So uh, the most basic thing, honestly, you can just do is take all your scraps and put them in a jar. So like put them in any container that's not corrosive. So glass works, uh, ceramic works, Pyrex works, wood would work if it's sealed really well, but not metal because vinegar corrodes metal. Certainly not cast iron or anything. Um, so I usually use glass. Um, my favorite is when I'm doing a lot, like a lot of apples, you get those big, uh, big ceramic crocks. Um, or like like butter churn, like old butter churns, the big thick ceramic ones. Oh, those are so good. And then you can just do a whole big batch at once. It's, it feels pretty ridiculous doing little jars like this. But this is all I have here. <clears throat> so in theory, um, all you really need to do is, um, you know, kind of shove, shove all your scraps into the jar there. And then we're going to top it off with water. I know that sounds crazy. They were like, what? You're adding water and we're not adding more sugar? How is there going to be enough sugars to make vinegar? The answer, I don't know. It's so magic. It's magical. It doesn't make sense that this should work, but it does. It just does. So I'm only adding enough water to just like barely cover, barely cover the scraps. You do want them completely submerged. You don't want solid sticking above the water. Um... But don't add too much water, because that's going to dilute these sugars way too much. If the sugars are that diluted, there's no way this is going to ferment well. Uh, vinegar fermentation, just like alcohol fermentation, relies upon sugars. So there is a, uh, there's a balance to how much water to add. But at the first day, err on the side of adding less water to just barely cover them. Um, and that's it. And then put a cheesecloth on top just to keep the bugs out, the fruit gnats, because they'll go nuts. So I have some jars that have been going for a little while, uh, larger jars. So if jars uh, have been going, like often every time I dry a batch of pears, I have more scraps. So I can just keep adding them over the days to a larger jar. You don't have to do it all at once. So here's a batch that's been fermenting. I'll talk about what that looks like in a minute. But in this instance, like, I would just be adding my pear scraps to this batch that's already going. Like, add them straight in there. Plop, plop, plop. And then I will want to add a little bit more water also if the solids can't all fit underneath the liquid. Okay? Because I added more solids, I need to add more liquid. All that nice juice. Ugh, pear juice. <laughs> Sorry. Give it a good stir, get it all under there. Make sure it's all under the liquid there. So I want to show you both of these jars are in their fermentation stage already. So I want to show you what that looks like. This is a jar that's already filled as much as I can fill it. And you can see that a bunch of these solids are collecting at the top here, and there's liquid here at the bottom. So that's the typical look of the first fermenting stage of making vinegar. Okay, so let me break it down. Okay, so vinegar fermenting 101. What's actually going on? If you already ferment uh, alcohol, like wine and beer, this will be really easy for you to understand. If you don't, this is all going to be brand new. So, number one. Uh, it all relies upon sugar. So here we're just using the fruit sugars. Um, 
obviously if you're doing alcohol fermentation, you know, people use uh, uh, cane sugar, people use uh, uh, honey to make mead, so like many other sugar sources. Um, so here's what's going on. Yeast, in this case just wild yeast, wild airborne yeast, yeasts that are on the surface of the fruits. Yeast is eating the sugars. Okay, Yeast poops out two things. Carbon dioxide, which is bubbles. That's why you see bubbles rising from an alcohol fermentation. The yeast poop out carbon dioxide and alcohol sugars. So they change the fruit sugars into alcohol sugars. That's what the yeast do. Vinegar making is a two-part process. Okay, So right on the heels of that process of the yeast, a bacteria, in this case a vinegar bacteria, which are airborne, they're just in the environment, they're everywhere. A vinegar bacteria is coming in behind the yeast. It is eating the alcohol sugars. Okay, And then it's pooping out acetic acid. Acetic acid is vinegar. Okay, So it's a double process. Um, which is why vinegar is often made from wine, like red wine vinegar is made from wine. Okay, so first you have the alcohol sugars, then the alcohol sugars are fermented into vinegar. Doing it this way though, the two processes kind of happen right on each other's heels, that it just seems like it's all kind of happening at once. And it seems to work the best that way. So um, that's why the first stage of the fermenting is going to be a bubbling stage, just like alcohol fermenting. Okay, so that's why you need to have it in a container where air can escape. So if you are fermenting alcohol, like if you're making wine or mead, one of the most important parts about fermenting is to airlock your container. That means you're figuring out some way so that air can escape the container. That air being carbon dioxide, all the bubbles that the yeast are pooping out. That's why pressure is building in the container because all this gas is being created. So that gas needs to escape, or else your container will explode. But when you're fermenting for alcohol, you don't want outside air to get back into the container. Because outside air, just air within the environment, contains vinegar bacteria, naturally occurring vinegar bacteria. So that's why when, um, like if the the, the, the top, whatever your, the top is for your alcohol ferment, like whether you have one of those little fancy gadgets, those little plugs that somehow do that for you, or like I just use like saran wrap or a screw lid, it's an art form, <laughs> but um, uh, that's why like if your lid comes loose while you're making wine or mead such that air is getting back into the wine and that goes on for days or weeks, then you go to taste the wine as it's fermenting and it just like starts to taste kind of off. It doesn't have that clear, strong alcohol flavors. It starts to have a little bit of a vinegary funk or sometimes just like a dullness or a muskiness. Most of the time that's due to vinegar bacteria starting to get into the wine and break down the alcohol sugars. So when you're making alcohol, you don't want that to happen. That's like that would be, that's that's the failure of, of the booze uh, with vinegar. Of course, we want to encourage that as much as possible. Okay, so that's why with the vinegar making, I'm specifically leaving tons of air space, right? So the cheesecloth is just to keep out bugs, but it allows tons of air to go in, to go out. We want lots of air because we want the vinegar bacteria to be really, really active. That's why vinegar making is really easy. It's really easy, you guys. Um, da, 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 da. A couple other things. Um, I say it's easy, but I don't expect every batch of vinegar to turn out perfectly. Um, because, for one, I'm not adding any starter. I'm not adding frickin' anything. I'm not controlling this process very much at all. I'm really just letting the wild yeast and bacteria do their thing. And that's just the way that I do vinegar. I do it super low-key, super wild. Other people get very technical about it. So 
just like alcohol fermenting, you can find your range in there. And that way with booze, you know, like I'll ferment some <laughs> like <laughs> wild black cherries in a little jelly jar, you know, and just like make some nice, some of my nice hooch. Um, I don't buy any gear at all. Zero for alcohol fermenting. I'm very low key about it. But they come out so good. My wines are so good. So, yeah, here's the thing is that especially if I'm experimenting with a new fruit, different fruits behave differently. Some make vinegar easily, some don't, some are fussier. So I'm not upset about if a jar fails, okay? That's why I'm not using like really, really nice fruits. I'm using stuff that's gonna be thrown away anyway, okay? So I really reiterate that. These are scraps. Um, that said though, I don't think I've ever had a batch of apple vinegar not come out fabulous. Apples just want to be vinegar. Except for, I think one time I did a little tiny bowl of, they were store-bought apples, like just scraps from somebody's kitchen, and they just got like moldy right away. They didn't like do the normal fermenting. They just kind of got like blue mold really quickly and were just gross. So that's a tip that uh, I would never make vinegar from store-bought fruit mm, intentionally. Like sometimes when you have like scraps in the kitchen, it's kind of tempting to be like, oh, maybe I'll just throw this all in a jar and make vinegar. And it's worth a try. Um, sometimes it'll work. Sometimes it won't. I think it's just that like a lot of store-bought fruit, it's just, I don't know if it's just the way that it's washed or there's like preservatives added to the skin that cover them that fuck up the yeast and stuff, something like that. So I give you that warning that just like this all works really well with fresh fruit from the land and the environment that hasn't had pesticides and herbicides and been washed in weird ways and um, uh, sanitized and stuff like that. So that's my one warning. Um, da, 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 da. what else? So it's a two-part process, and with most fruit, um, I typically expect the vinegar making process to be at least a couple months. Um, this isn't a quick thing, and if you just let it take its time, it's going to go well. It's going to go better. Um, yeah, like it. I don't know, a month and a half, three months, it just, it just kind of depends. Just let it do its thing. Let it do its thing. So the first stage is going to be the bubbling stage, and that's going to happen very quickly. So here's my jar that I just filled with, like, the fresh scraps, and I just added the water. And that's what it looks like. That's all it is. It's some fruit scraps and some water. That's it. Okay, so it might look like this on your kitchen table for a day or two or three until it starts to ferment. Um, a lot of these are just so juicy, they've been fermenting, starting to ferment in a day really fast. Once they start to ferment, by which I mean once the alcohol fermentation starts, so once the yeasts start to eat the fruit sugars, uh, they're going to be pooping out the carbon dioxide, you're going to start seeing the bubbles, okay, and that's going to be the first obvious sign, the first obvious good sign that the process is happening well. Some tips on that. So that's why early on in the process, I check on my jars, or ideally like a big crock, a big old crock, every day, every day. Um, because here's what happens. So here's just a half gallon jar, and because all the bubbles are coming up ferociously, they're gonna push all of the solids to the top of the liquid. Also, the longer the solids are in here, you see they're just starting to disintegrate. Apples don't do that so much. The apple slices don't disintegrate quite as much as the pears, but these pears are almost just like turning into mush in there. So the bubbles are forcing the solids up, and they're going to do it constantly. So here's a tip. Don't fill your jar all the way to the top with water and fruit scraps. Like maybe I could fill, I could fill this a teeny bit more. Don't do it! Don't, don't, don't try to top it off, because once that bubbling starts, it's going to push the solids up, and your jar is just going to be overflowing with 
the nice liquid seeping out all over the counter, all over the table. It could be happening for hours. And then you come home and you check on it and you're like, oh no, this happens to me all the time to this day. I'm like, oh, I'm just going to fill it up a little bit more. It'll be fine. And then once the fermentation gets so vigorous, it's just like overflowing everywhere. And I'm like, no, don't do it. Don't do it. Okay. But here's the thing is that uh, those fruit solids and the fruit sugars, they're not going to rot in a bad way as long as they stay underwater. Okay. So uh, if they stay, because see, they're all pushed up. They're all, the solids are kind of laying above the surface of the liquid now. Uh, if they lay up there too long, they're going to mold because they have contact with the air. So that means at least once a day. Sometimes I do two or three times a day just to like love up on the vinegars and like give them attention. Uh, but at least once a day during the bubbling stage, give it a vigorous stir. Okay, what that's going to do is get the bubbles out, release the bubbles, and that's going to push all the solids back down to the bottom. Um, and the agitation is really good. I really like a lot of agitation for the vinegar making. It's like, see, it's like so, I don't know if you can see, super bubbly now. Like all these bubbles are at the top. Like all the bubbles that got stuck underneath the solids are able to like, oh, finally like float up now. Because you don't want air to get trapped down in there. If you have air pockets that are trapped, those it's also going to start to go funky. Okay, so you don't want solids rising above the surface of the liquid for too long because they'll mold. You don't want air pockets trapped for long periods of time because they'll go funky and mold and, and make things rot in a bad way. So that's why there's a balance between adding how much water you add. Because if you only add a teeny bit of water and you like jam the solids under the water, it can be so tight that the air bubbles can't really escape and they just get stuck in there. If, if your whole solution is more like a thick gel, they get stuck. So you, you need it liquidy enough that like the air bubbles can escape out of there, at least when you agitate it once a day. So if it's a big old crock, uh, the best way for me is I just take off the cheese lid on the crock and just, I'll wash my hand, wash my hand, wash my arm first in soap and water get it clean and then just plunge your whole hand and whole arm into the whole crock and just give it like a vigorous stir it around anything that's any solids that are up on the top just plunge them back down in there give it a good old agitation and I think that really really makes a difference it really helps um, all these solids because this is vigorously bubbling all these solids are gonna be back up top probably in an hour <laughs> so you don't have to constantly do it but at least once a day do it. Okay, that's why I like to keep the jar someplace where I can see it during this early stage, so I remember to do that. This stage is also going to start to smell nice. It's going to smell like a little bit like beer, beery and fruity, because it's the alcohol fermentation going on, so it should smell quite nice. Um, so that's what you're going to do, and just tend to them during this stage. Um, and how long the bubbling stage lasts just depends. It's done when it's done. You know, it might last a week, two weeks, maybe three, probably not. Um, but it takes as long as it takes. It takes as long as it takes for the yeast to eat all the sugars, all the fruit sugars. Once there's no more fruit sugars left, they have nothing to eat. So they go dormant. They either go dormant or die, depending on uh, the environment. So no more bubbles, okay? So do this stirring thing, this stirring tending thing for as long as the liquids are bubbling, okay? Eventually they're gonna stop. They'll, they'll, the bubbling will slow over days and then stop. Then we've entered phase two of the vinegar fermentation process, okay? Where the yeast have finished their job and now the vinegar bacteria are really just going to start mm, settling in, doing their magic. I mean, they've been active the whole time, but then they just take over and they do their magic, magic, magic. So I'm going to show you one other jar that is now in that stage. 
Okay, so here's the two jars that are in the bubble fermentation stage. Um, yes, it's stupid to have all these jars. I don't recommend having like lots of little jars. I just don't have a nice big crock here, which feels frustrating. But so this is what I got, so this is what I'm doing. Here's a jar I just took down from inside the farmhouse on top of a piece of furniture in a corner of a room in the quiet dark. That's where this one has been living. And it's at the stage where I don't like to move them or to mess with them at all, but I did to bring it out here to show you for this video. And then it's gonna go back and it's quiet dark and it's gonna stay there for weeks or months. So um, first thing to notice, so this jar, the glass is a, is a light blue, it's an old jar, so it has a light blue colored glass so that's tinting the color of the fruit. So don't let that fool you. The color of the liquid has not changed. It's just that uh, the blue glass looks a little different. Blue. So what you'll notice is on this jar, since the bubbling has stopped, the solids now have sunk to the bottom. They're all down here. And nice liquid is up here at the top. Okay, so once the bubbles all stop, that stops pushing the solids up relentlessly. So then the solids will just kind of all settle down and you won't have the problem of solids pushing up over the surface of the liquid anymore. So that's your indicator. That's your cue. that like, oh, okay. The yeast, the alcohol fermentation yeast portion of the process is finished. They've eaten all the sugars. Uh, so at this stage, you can, if you want to, strain this and strain out the solids and have just a liquid and put it back in the jar. I usually don't. I usually just leave the solids in the bottom because it, it's just, it's fine. It doesn't, it's no problem to do it that way. And I don't like to disturb it too much. So in the dark, on top of that piece of furniture, which you would have seen before I moved it, and my moving it jostled it, which feels, I feel bad about that. But what you would have seen are the very beginnings of a very thin whitish layer starting to form on top of the liquid. And now it just kind of got broken up. Like you can see little bits of it along the edges here that got jostled when I moved it. But that's what's going to start happening. That's why during this stage you want to put the jar somewhere where you're kind of going to forget about it. So the first stage, the bubble stage, put it somewhere where you see it all the time. So you remember to agitate it. After the bubble stage, put it somewhere where you're going to forget about it, where it's not going to get jostled, you're not going to touch it, and I like to do it in darkness, Rel relative darkness, it doesn't have to be pitch black. Okay, and you're just going to let it sit with the cheesecloth on it for weeks or months. Um, you're basically going to let it sit until you see it form a beautiful mother of vinegar on the top. It looks just like a kombucha mother. Um, so either that will happen, either a mother of vinegar will form, like a big gelatinous jelly thing on the top. Or calm yeast will form, which is a thinner layer that has a different look. What we want is the vinegar mother to form ideally. Usually vinegar makers don't want the calm yeast to happen instead. That's usually a sign that the fermentation is not quite going the way that you want it to. Um, but more on that. I'll talk a little bit more on that later. So I'm just going to leave this, uh, leave this up there for quite a while longer. And also, it's going to start smelling differently now. Like when I take off the cheesecloth and take a whiff, the smell is starting to change. It's starting to get like headier, deeper, more vinegary. And uh, the taste of the liquid and the aroma is going to start at this point to get more and more and more vinegary as it goes. Okay.